Yeah. Thank you, Sram. I guess the other reason is because someone sort of had to tell a story about what happened. Okay. First of all, I don't know exactly what happened. <laughs> all right. But I have my own interpretation of what happened. And also, not only that, but I have some stories and some things that we can put together and we'll, we'll kind of give everyone a feel of the time and the energy and the era uh, the days, things like this event is so historic and so special. Um, my name is Greg Herbal. I'm a special agent at large, the Jack Corporation. I'm 53 years old, currently married. I have one dog. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> okay. So we're going to get started here. We have a little video just to kind of set the scene because they think. Arena of mountain biking. All right. 
We had Northern National Championships there. We had Iron Horse Racing there. Luckily, we had this amazing facility close to town with an awesome track. Um, Vulture's Roost was in one of my favorite sections because it was jump across the water crossing. You had to haul that down. Everyone would be jumping, hitting their brakes. I'd be like, see you, feet, and then fly up there. And as you can see, fashions were pretty sweet, right? <laughs> Back back then, this is a wheelie contest. We had one of the nationals, the Johnny T, John Brennan, some of the wheelie, I don't know that. But how much were Oshawa, as you can see? Yeah. I think I won a pizza at Barkworth. I can't remember, something like that. Um, so I kept racing, and I realized the sport was going to be big. And so I, uh, through Team Yada and Bicycle Bob, I got $500 to go to this place called Man. And I did a race, which is the very first dual slalom, official dual slalom, um, that was in America. And somehow, I won. And the coolest part is I beat a bunch of legends that were, like, my heroes. And one of those guys was this guy right here. But the key was, you know, the sport was taking off. We had factory paid riders, we had interest, we had fans. The sport was taking off. So we had to work on our own bikes. <laughs> this is actually me and Johnny T in the Drangle Factory. <laughs> this bed still exists. As you can see, I still have the same hair, dude. Johnny's is a little different. Um, <laughs> However, the key was you had to work on your own bike. The development of the bike and develop technology is critical. And we spent a lot of time trying to keep these bikes running. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the reason I bring this up is that we're in the bleachers. Okay? It's pretty sweet that we're at a race and there's bleachers. <laughs> like we rode over every mountain pass and abandoned skier in Colorado for like six years, and somewhere at a place and they had a bleacher. I'm like, we gotta get in that bleacher. <laughs> so, one of the guys who was also a pioneer is Ed Z. Let's give a hand for Ed Z. Yeah! <laughs> so, this is Ed in Afghanistan, Peru, Bolivia. Someplace getting his adventure on. <laughs> As you can see, he's a little overdressed. It, it does look like he's about to pass out, but he's still awesome in his head. And guess what? It's before Ned. <laughs> now, suddenly this guy arrived <laughs> and had to battle a lot of guys. So these are all factory stuff. Slim, Joe Murray, Theobald, Cook. Somebody else. <laughs> uh, so now we are we are literally at the AN period of time, the afternoon period of time. <laughs> so we were trying to explain to the engineers um, how to make these bikes better. Because we're bending force, toppling wheels, things were falling apart. We need to make them better. So my whole sponsorship and job was, on, was based on the fact that I fax reports to Japan. That's why I got more bikes. That's why I got more money. And that enabled me to win races. The key is there's sometimes there's a communication gap. But I don't see why, because we're so alike. <laughs> okay, so then something else happened. I was on a trip called the Clueless Tour in 1989 in Europe with about eight other American mountain bikers. And, and we, we went, a lot, went through a lot of stuff. But one thing that happened is we were in Spa, Belgium for the unofficial world championships and there was a meeting taking place that we were supposed to attend. We went over there, we were in the smoke-filled room, there was all these Belgian, Dutch, and Swiss guys in suits. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. I didn't know what was going on. Then all of a sudden, I see Ed. I'm like, wait a minute, something's happening here. What happened was, they were announcing the official, the official sanctioning of USA, uh, excuse me, of UCI, for mountain bike racing. It was a huge announcement. So I'm thinking, wow, this is really great, this is super awesome. And the disciplines are, I'm thinking, cross country and trial, cross country and trial. <laughs> cross country and downhill. And I'm like, yeah! Okay, he got better. I always wondered why Ed was there. So they did some hubble to and suspension, and suspension, and germinating, and smoking with cigarettes. And finally, like, and then a special announcement is that the first official world championships are going to be held in Durango, Colorado. <laughs> I heed my blue ass. Oh, by the way, I won the race. Okay.
minutes and 37 seconds, 6 minutes and 37.43. At the World Cup there in 2001, those guys did the same start and the same finish in 2 minutes, 57 seconds. <laughs> they didn't have near the adventure I had. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is this is a transitional period. So this is me in the morning after I won the race. This is me in the morning after the race. You can see there's a huge change in my life. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I have to say one thing. To say that that day and winning the world championships you know, changed my life forever is a huge understatement. Every day of my life since then has been different. And somehow, one way or other, I either either recognized or notified or whatever gets around me. And that's a pretty special thing to be part of history. I'm super proud of that. And um, I think that's something that doesn't happen all the time. So I'm selling it if you guys want it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another thing that happened was I had to race two races in one day. So I raced the downhill in the morning, and then at the opening ceremonies, which I wasn't part of the national team because they didn't like hippies. <laughs> what? Okay. Um, I wasn't in the opening ceremony, but I won the gold medal, was awarded the gold medal that night. So that night, I literally went back to my 65 Ford pickup, pulled out my bike, same bike, lowered the seat, kept the seat bag on there, and <laughs> <laughs> the ball. Hey, you get, guys, there's no can. You can't raise your hand. Don't do it right now. I'm sure taking care of pussy pussy. You around? But literally, I just remember the whole crowd was working its way down over to Chapman Hill, and I was like inching my way with my brakes. The whole place was lit up, and I was just saying to myself, I'm in a Super Bowl. <laughs> so, as you know, like, things have changed. Uh, there's a lot of energy being sponsored. And sponsors, uh, this is right after I won, I got second in the fall and played first in the second. And that was the energy drink of the day, Tommy Can. Or but as you can see, the kids were still enamored with, you know, the heroism that took place. <laughs> Okay, we're going to start with ladies, because ladies are first. Except for me. Um, so the ladies are a pretty amazing group of characters. This is actually the starting line for the World Championship Cross Country. As you can see, there's a lot of tension. Um, yeah. Pretty awesome, though. And as you can see, it's a really level, nice starting area. <laughs> so there's three significant people that were victorious.
kind of special, even though she's not watching. Sarah Valentine was kind of special in a lot of ways. First of all, I knew her from the very beginning. And the other thing is that, you know, she really paved the way for European racing. Americans going to Europe. She had this drive to beat everybody, no matter where it was, any place, any time, any day. And the general did a great job. She was also on the crew with her. And this is a this happened a lot on the Clintus tour in 1989 in Europe. And just so you know, this isn't Sarah asking the course marshal which way the course goes. This is Sarah telling him where they need to change this. <laughs> I don't know why there's some height disparity in this sort of like blood and stuff. So Sarah powered on not only to win official world championships, but numerous national championships, continued to grow into other forms of racing after mountain biking. She raced camels across the damn block. Was that block? Where was it? Adventure race Hi, help me out here. And then Big Wing. <laughs> she ran. She raced camels across the damn Now, the key about Sarah is that she opened the door for most of those female athletes, whether they were mountain or road. She set the bar that you can do this if you work hard. It's not glamorous, it's not pretty, but guess what? You can win races and you can make things happen. You know, her relationship with Gary Fisher was huge. It really was. Like, he loved her so much that he would build bikes for her. They were small. They were ripped. And they were the best bikes. There she goes, crossing the finish line. You can me. Okay. Juliana Furtado. So, this look is what it took to win the World Championship. <laughs> and it took that look for two hours. And she did it. Another, another lady who kind of came out of nowhere. No one was expecting it. Of course, Dick and Parker, the Yeti, had figured it out. Like, you get this ring on your band, and you can be maybe like, She came in there and roosted everyone's mug in 1990 at first. As you can see, at this point, the three feet to go. The grim is turned into a mug. Yeah, whatever. She, she didn't fall off. That's the thing. Okay, your feet Yeah. 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 <laughs> now, and then a great thing about Juliana, again, like a bunch of people in the room, is she's still involved in the industry. She's a spokesperson and representative for her own line of life, manufactured by Santa Cruz. And she's involved with her own team, own development, own sizing, own awesome things. So here's another person, 25 years later, who's not only giving back to the industry, but being a big part of what's happening with life. Okay, I love the short shorts. <laughs> that was short shorts, but that was a Canadian thing, okay? The Canadian thing. Uh, and even why, wait, what? Just so you know, they're back. So, if you find on the podium, winning the winner, senior downhill world title. Female downhill racing was even more interesting. And there were amazing riders all levels of sport. There was if no fashion cold riders. There's no fashion cold riders because you didn't fire them. They had to put the Klein thing right here. Anyhow, the point is, the point is, it was a brave endeavor just to race down there. The bikes weren't different. The, you know, your setup wasn't different. The tracks were different. And they were scary and fast and dangerous. And these girls fight in. This is L.D. Brown, who's also here tonight. Where's the yeah. L.D.? Yeah. So Cindy took one of the, one of the controversial lines that day, um, straight across the grass. But again, this is what it takes if you want to get the stripes. If you're going to be all fancy now and be all happy, cute, you ain't winning. Okay? So, not that anything in general is not that classic. Susan Tobias is there, and Kitty. So, you know, a lot of girls don't like to do dirty, okay? If they do, it's like, take some laundry and clean up. So, during this era, okay, when you cross the finish line and you're about to pass out, you have to sit on your ass for a while in your soggy chammy, wondering why the hell you were, what the hell you were doing out there. Okay, I'll yeah!
So I first met Elodie in 1987 in Whistler, Canada. And I don't remember how old she was, but I'm pretty sure she was on. <laughs> and she was right, okay? I remember she came up and she was like, Do you mean ski? I was like, You have a fourth girl with two chain guards. Let me meet your tail. I'm like, This little girl is interested. So <laughs> Ellie went on to not only get second in the world championships in the downhill, but numerous other victories. And again, like I said, I've been part of the industry ever since to making good values, good skills, good communication. Sorry. And currently works as an a individual, independent rep in the Whistler, British Columbia, Vancouver area for Shimon, which I've heard share parts of it. I can't be wrong. And it was exciting and real, 
And talk about bringing the community together. I've never seen one event in my life anywhere in the world that brought the whole community together. So we got to give a shout out to Easy Rider. Classic. And Ed Dink making the decision that we want the world. We want to do something special. We got fishing trails, we got amazing trails, we got good people that are good athletes, let's do it. So here's Ed, the Chancellor of New Zealand. I don't know who that guy is. As you know, he has a ship note uh, making a speech. But that's not Ed's only job is making speeches. Because he made a lot of them. Okay, here's Ed arguing with the UCI officials about. Whoa, 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 what do you mean we got to move the stars? You can see from this guy's hand, he's not kind of situation. And they just want to break. Again, more speeches, content speeches. I hate to say it, but somewhere I think Tom Ricky is trying to talk about. More speeches. <laughs> speeches everywhere. That guy <laughs> sold the crap out of this town. And sold, and sold this event so well you can't believe. You know, it takes a lot of people to make that happen. One person can't just walk out and do that. You have to talk to the police. <laughs> I don't know why this is shot through the other window. And usually, Ed should be here, the police should be there. <laughs> also, he learned how to drive volunteers. <laughs> with amazing gold bars that during the day, during the era, were just and look at him, just going out like, yeah, check me. Hey, apple, apple crisp. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, apple crisp down there, yeah, that is. <laughs> of course, communication was key. And Ed had the first iPhone point three. And he used religiously in the Chevy sponsored truck, which I don't think he ever gave back. <laughs> and it takes more than just a seat. Yeah, um, first of all, let's give a round for Ed because <laughs> really, this guy has been more than a round around the world than anyone we know. So we have to have other people. Yeah. This is Patty Vink. Okay. Patty was in charge of all the media relations, marketing, all that stuff. She had no idea that there was going to be 75 media all over the world. 375 media people <laughs> all over the world. I told you this is how I remember it. Okay, I'm just correcting uh, you because that's my job. And so, because of that, they gave her a lunch, lunchbox full of gold bars. <laughs> <laughs> but Patty had the enthusiasm and the drive to work hard, be hard, and make the right decisions, and it hurt people in the right direction, provide the information they needed, wrestle them up to get free toast, do whatever they had to do. It's really important that people like Patty were there, so here's the Patty thing. So, who doesn't love Coke? <laughs> you know, like, this kind of Everybody likes Coke? Okay. Coke was super important, and the Maple family was amazing to not only believe in the fact that we could put on this kind of race, but give us the initial investment to market the race, promote the race, and make everything happen. To this day, Coke is still one of the huge benefactors, one of the huge beneficiaries. Benefiters. They give away a lot of money and shit. Sorry. <laughs> to everything cycling in this area. And I think that's really important, you know. I love Coke. I drink Coke all the time. Now that they have monster chips, I like it even more. <laughs> but here's the Coke. So we talk about like what happened back then and how important it was that the community came together. But you know, it's not over. Even twenty five years later. This community is one of the strongest mountain bike cycling communities I know of. And I live in another one called MOA. And it's strong, but it's nothing like this. Our Durango Devo program. Okay. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of kids that signed up. A program that started out with 10 kids that's developing this huge network. Okay? That wouldn't happen if there wasn't a passion for cycling and there's an for cycling. Trails came to Alger. Apparently, they make really sick trips. I'm going to get checked now. Trail 2000 started out, one guy's idea, a little dream. I don't know how many thousands of dollars I gave way back in the day when I was like, woo, I'll buy it. You know, a, a, a tree trip. Like, anything could happen. Like, 
It was awesome. Very good job. It was awesome. Built up into amazing things. But like, the cool part is the community engagement of the volunteers, the land access, you know, the whole thing is great. Now, Trail 2000, huge for the huge for the I wasn't a very good trail too bad. You married the wrong guy. I'll be there. Okay, so the other big part about the world is the super unique. He was really international. At that point, there was a handful of Americans that had raised from different countries. There was a handful of Canadians, all in their stupid micro bus. Like, hey, can I get bad man? Like, tell me The reality of it was, it wasn't super international. Okay, but suddenly, the world brought all the countries together. And they came in makeshift stuff. Coochie guys, this next year, whole some of them whole teams with managers and everything, way ahead of us. But they all came to the World Championship of And who doesn't love a good hero photo? Come on. <laughs> the heroes up the game. And this was the start. You know what we did? We gave them a little taste of what Mountain Bike was like, and they were like, we can do this. And they ran with it. And from that day on, we have battled the Euros internationally every step of the way. It's not just Euros. It's South American, it's the anyone all over the world. But the world noticed that mountain biking was cool, it was fun, and we want to race it. She's so hot right now. She's still got the blues. So I want to talk about a few people that aren't here that were significant to the, to the whole culture around it. Right? And these are world championships, world champions. One is Miles Rockwell. Miles Rockwell won the world championships in 2000. It was pretty amazing. When I first met, first met this kid, he was racing me in a cutoff sweatshirt and jeans. And just going, yeah, dude, you're not so cool. I can keep you good. I'm going to be the next world champion. You should shut up. <laughs> and guess what? He was one of the most talented riders I ever rode with. We talk about natural talent. I've got to ride with some of the best, most talented riders in the world. That guy right there had more natural talent on his big, you know what, than my whole body put together. And to, to, to see that he finally harnessed that and made that happen, that's spectacular. Miles has been a long time during our residence. He just recently moved. Um, but we got to give, these guys were here and they were real champions. And look how awesome he looks. Thank you, Miles. Okay. So there's this other crazy chick that showed up there. <laughs> it's a joke. And just so you know, she brought more F bombs to this town than anyone has. <laughs> and she's still throwing them out like candy. <laughs> I'm telling you. Nothing's changed there. But you know, the Missy came there. She, she brought a lot of attention. She won a lot of races. She made stuff happen. And she's still making stuff happen. <laughs> You know, I have to say two things, you know, just one little thing about the guys. You know, they were way ahead of their time with the whole, like, recreational marijuana thing. They kind of, again, we are, but you know, they were just, again, we are cutting edge here in Durango, okay? So, they were ahead of their time. Okay, they were ahead of their time. But either way, yeah, they were there and they were awesome. One of my favorite Missy stories is that she crashed on a motorcycle down in Aztec and, like, got all beat up. And she was going to physical therapy, so she had this quad. And she decided she was going to ride the quad all the way through town to her physical therapy. So I'm riding my bike down the street and I hear this flip there. And there's Missy on the third avenue of Esplanade, roosting between the trees on the grass. <laughs> headed out to farmers, headed out, yes, to the sports club to get physical therapy. You're broken pelvis. <laughs> Pretty special people. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the boys now. Oh! So, there's a lot of rivalries in this room. Some of them good, some of them bad. Most of them are friendly. You know, luckily mountain biking is a kind of sport where it's kind of about you. It's about you and your preparation and your skill and your strategy. It's not about the other guys. So. Put your mic up your mouth. Well, I have to ask my AG guy back there to turn my mic up. <laughs> okay, can you guys hear me now? Can you turn your mic how about now? How about now? Okay. Here's what I want to know is, why don't vampires have friends? 
Nobody? But they're paying the net. <laughs> Sitting with a bunch of geniuses. You want one more? You sure? Why do boobs have nipples? Because otherwise they'd be pointless. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, we're getting there. Okay, so there's rivals in the room. The main thing is, is that there were icons in the sport that are, that are in this room right now that made their mark at this race and that are, are super critical to the advancement of the sport. And these are two of those guys. All right. Uh, uh, I don't know why this one didn't work. I apologize why this one didn't work. Um, He's not a robot. Look at Vintage Photo Johnny T at the World Championships with his drops. So, I always have to thank Johnny T, and if I was a family man, I would send him Christmas cards. But I don't, but he sends them to me all the time. God bless him. Because Johnny T had this great idea that he was going to revolutionize the sport and make everyone go from flat Tioga bar to 150 T-bone stand to drop bars. And he was convinced it was going to happen. I followed that guy around the whole county for a year and a half, riding nose wheelies down the craziest shit you ever saw. There you go. Unbelievable. And you know, I appreciate him using that in downhill. Give me that jersey thing. Okay, here's the benefit. So this position, like, you don't know I mean, how often, like, I saw Johnny T's butt for like two years. But the key was, he didn't care about the rules. He had his own opinion, he had his own identity, he had his own ideas. And that's what's great about the sport. Everyone's individual, you can do whatever you want. Like, it's downhill, you want to race cross country, you can cross, whatever. There's tons of options. There's no, no place you have to go. There's no slot car track. This is RC, baby. You can go into there. <laughs> Uh, right, another awesome place. So this is the second reason I should, should, should be sending Johnny birthday cards, which I don't. <laughs> because he decided to go road racing. And I was like, Mitch, you want to go race with the Euros? He's like, yeah. Um, <laughs> knock me up a notch. <laughs> but Johnny didn't just go road racing. He did it with all his heart and all his passion. He was one of the best teams in the world he's ever lived. I'll never forget him telling me what it was like getting last place in the Perry Bay. And dude, if you can get last place in the Perry Bay, you got hard and you got soul. So about that packing thing I was talking about. It was windy. All over the valley. The part of that passion is creating family. I guess what I really love about this picture is if you think about Johnny T from the very first picture, this crew cut, uh, the, uh, excuse me, his JT outfit, to Johnny T the cowboy, the family man, I never thought that would have happened. And it's awesome. And you know what? I'm still convinced it happened because of the 1990 world. <laughs> so, of course, they had offspring. I wonder why. Um, this is the Mount Snow. Most of us remember racing in Alabama. Black flies everywhere. And this is Johnny T and Kathy running, chasing this little guy. So, his little guy Eli, six and a half, has grown to become one of the top motocross and supercross racers in the world. And again, just like Johnny T, the amount of commitment and dedication and hard work they put in, taking that kid all over the world since he was this tall to where he is now the most successful professional athlete in the four corners. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 Eli would just like to say he'd like to be here tonight, but of course he needs to go on a train trip and a speed trip. That's your vagina team. Come on. Violet.
whatever it works. Okay. So we're going to talk about some more men. So I was playing by some fine young gentleman. I got no way to. And one of them is this guy right here. But again, I find lots of the skinny. Lots of short. Michael Hurt. So, you know, Mike was a great cross country rider. Always a solid mountain biker all around. But people were surprised that he did so well at that event. Well, I had raced, we had raced two months earlier in the Colorado State Championships. And one of the most tricky parts of the course we used during that cross country race. I remember battling with him and following two Swire's goals. And he knew how to bunny hop, he knew how to set up, he knew how to turn. I was like, because right after that was the 35 second climb. And I knew there was no way to give up that guy in the box. So I was like, I gotta hang it out horribly <laughs> to make sure I'm not gonna puke inside that climb. He's gonna be good. The good part is he didn't beat me, and he got sick. <laughs> so here's Mike in the cross entry. And I can see his battle with the other guy over here. This is Rishi Greywall. And Rishi Greywall is also in the room. So the crazy part is, is he's kind of tiny with an apron. He's just an old picture, but he's looking at that new interface. And he does this in rail. So, I don't know, they got special stuff there. I know that he worked on an Indian Tigers, like, commuter bike. That's what I've heard. I think he's a Benjamin Buckley. Yeah, I don't know how that works, but yeah. But the cool part about Mike, and I gave him tons of respect to this from the very beginning, is that again, Mike, like Sarah, pioneered Americans racing in Europe. He was the first guy to make a commitment to go over there, eat a crappy food, deal with those people, like, figure out how the racing system works, right? And race there, and he came back and told us, he's like, you guys, it's free screen. We can make money here. You gotta check it out. You know? Super pioneer. So I think that done racing, of course, he also, like, zip line across the Grand Canyon, road camels across the Grand Canyon. Get all the stuff. And now he owns a huge backpacking manufacturing plant in Nova Scotia. I don't know where it is. Of course, always representing the HP tag. Okay, so Rishi. This is one of the fiercest competitors we ever had in the circus. Because Rishi, he did to lose. He did. And hated everyone that beat him. All day, every day. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you're a turkey, you're bullshit, you suck. Like I beat you. I don't care. You still suck. But you know, Rishi had that drive, and he had the skill, and he had the intensity. The thing about Rishi is he knew when to win when it counted. When we had the ride of your life, $10,000 in first place first, mostly downhill course, like an early enduro race, no fail, we got smoked by Rishi. And this is way before Dan's boy and all that stuff. He's on the freaking podium and he's like, we gave him a $10,000 check. He's like, I'd like to thank my legs for getting me up to here. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing about Rishi is, he's supposed to be concentrating on racing the cross country here, but he's distracted. Like, he's trying to record because this is the world's favorite. <laughs> That's all we know about her. And she's the world's favorite. Get out, stupid. Okay, T. Brown. Travis Brown, local boy, local as you can get. Okay? This guy started riding, he got pretty good. He was like, I don't know, he was high school, I would just say high school athlete. Like, say I did one of those stuff. But he was pretty good, okay? So we started, we started mountain biking. We started coming on rides and started all that. Well, this was his chance to shine. We were all expected to win. He wasn't expected to win or even do good. But guess what? Whether he knew about him or not, he raced in the Durango Wheel Club on probably a bar track or some country track, and he persevered all the way to the end to finish 10th in the World Championship. That is pretty amazing. So, what I was going to say is it doesn't matter if you got gold medal or you got 10th place. This race made a difference for a lot of people's lives. I know it was Travis. So, Travis did that because he really swung wide on a lot of corners. <laughs> I have a feeling that the Coke guys, Maples, maybe put those things up there and see how they look burn for <laughs> <laughs> I could be wrong, but probably. The other thing about Travis is, you know, it's weird that during that era, after the world, people became icons and celebrities, and we had to look at 
Travis would <laughs> Normal guys can't 
stick their pinky all the way up their nostril. <laughs> he can do it. So the key is that Ned had a great beginning. And as you can see, he got his pina colada and he still got his little spins out of mine. Give me a try after we use some both bags of tennis, what are you? All I know is he showed up and he was using the next big guy and Ned's stuck the other uh, sidewinder, string slide, sidewinder, whatever. Well, he ended up being not just the next big guy, but pretty much the big guy for him. You know, the thing about Ned that I think is most impressive to me is his climbing technique. <laughs> <laughs> you have to understand. We had 32, 32. Actually, 28, 28. We had 28, 28. You had to get off. And when you get off and you have this technique with a jungle gym in front of you, how can you lose? You know, the key to this is the fact that the best heroes in the world, the fastest public class racers, the fastest road racers, came to Durango to win that race. And a local guy beat him. And he didn't just beat him. He made him suffer. And even when they did this old school thing, oh. not pushing their bike or running, I said, he's like, stay me, knob dog. And that was Victoria. Yeah. And of course, this will forever be the greatest moment in cycling history in Durango. For <laughs> so that's important. But you know, again, it goes way beyond that. Ned has put so much into this community, whether it's donating money, donating land, donating time, developing resources, being at the bike shop all the time, going on the club ride, right? those time trials on a Tuesday afternoon. It's a bar. We can do it. Everything you can imagine. And then, that's, that's washing bikes tonight, HB. Sweet. Yeah. And the other cool thing that people don't realize about Ned is, you know, he's addicted to bikes and he's addicted to training. And because of that, he's made the whole mountain bike world a better place. He is the spokesperson for one of the biggest companies in the world. And like, literally, Mike Senior has him on a leash. And <laughs> walking around. And you know what? That's not easy. This, I call this guy, he's like, I'm going to the South American dealer meeting and go get tall. And I'm like, sure. Like, oh, I'm going dirt biking. <laughs> this dude is everywhere, and he's working hard. I don't know where he's throwing all that gold. But it's a fat pile, and he deserves it. And more than that, you guys, without people like Ned, the rest of us old parts wouldn't have a chance to even think that we could do the things we can do. Because this guy does it. He beats the young kids, and yes, he's a mutant, but you know what? We can all become mutants in one way or another. So, you guys, here's the Ned over. It's all Lloyd Bruni 
again when the downhill world championships like on a rock stock product. And the crazy part is, believe it or not, 25 years later, some of that basic technology in there we're still using. So here's the win. Thank <laughs> you. 
But it's a grand fun though. Yeah. 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 Yeah.